So it's really, really wonderful to, uh, to uh, um, uh, be here. Um, I'm talking about um, uh, some work that should come out uh, hopefully pretty soon with um, uh, uh, Song Hei, uh, uh, Giulio Salvatore, who's a student in Milan, but is going to be a postdoc here at Brown starting in, uh, in the fall, a wonderful young guy, and um, uh, my friend, the mathematician Hugh Thomas. Um, as well as an, uh, another math friend of mine, uh, Tom X. Lamb. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, those of you who have suffered through uh, talks of mine for the past five, six, eight years or so, um, uh, these combinations of words have, uh, have, have shown up in a, few, uh, in, a num in a number of places. Uh, maybe that word is, uh, uh, is, is a little different. Um, but uh, what I want to do today, and it's going to be mostly a blackboard talk, a uh, whiteboard talk, I'll have uh, uh, just a few slides so I don't have to draw complicated polytopes in real time, but um, uh, something which, is, which has happened in the past, um, you know, really a uh, year and a half or so, uh, is that we've started seeing a lot of these geometric structures, fundamentally combinatorial structures that seem to control the uh, uh, physics of scattering amplitudes, first, um, uh, in the first instance, seen in a very special setting of n equals 4 super Yang mills and so on. We're starting to see it in much more general settings and, in a sense, more elementary settings. Um, uh, nothing to do with supersymmetry, has nothing to do with integrability, nothing like that. Uh, just boring old phi cube theory, um, something that controls rather universal uh, infrared behavior of uh, really any kind of theory where ultimately the kind of uh, uh, singularities you have are associated with the cubic diagrams. It sort of covers everything uh, that, we, uh, that we know of. Um, and uh, while in n equals 4 and in gauge theories uh, the, the relevant combinatorial geometric objects are, are they're simple and sort of deep but they're very new, um, uh, these older things, uh, these more elementary things are actually associated with also more elementary uh, famous old geometric objects that are understood in a more, uh, uh, which nonetheless have a lot of new and interesting uh, features about them, both physically and mathematically. And so that's really, I think it's now possible to give, if you like, a self-contained um, uh, uh, invitation to this whole way of uh, uh, thinking about the world in a very, very simple context. Uh, so that's the, the real emphasis here is on the word elementary. Uh, I like to say in this subject that you know everything about the amplitahedron could be explained to kids in high school. Uh, this is something that could be extended to bright kids in grade six. So, uh, um, so it's even more uh, uh, elementary. Now, um, let me. Uh, 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 Andy gave a very beautiful talk this morning and laying out a lot of the motivations. The motivations are essentially identical uh, um, to what I'm going to um, uh, talk about. Uh, let me just uh, say the same things again. Uh, we're very used to the holographic ideology when we have quantum mechanics and gravity. The, at least quantum mechanical observables are only well-defined out in boundaries where things don't fluctuate. Um, but uh, in anti de Sitter space, we have the luxury that when we go to the obvious geometric boundary, there's something reasonable to do there. It's a familiar space. It has a, it has a metric. It has a notion of locality. It has a notion of time. And so if you have the holographic ideology and you want to ask what, what, you're supposed to a what question you're supposed to ask on the boundary that has all the richness and complexity of boundary correlators, the answer is you put a quantum field theory that lives there on the boundary. It's a totally reasonable thing to do. There's a notion of locality. There's a notion of time. Now what happens when we go to flat space, much closer to the real world, when we go to flat space, none of those luxuries are obviously available to us. Um, so you imagine that you're you know, the simple-minded experimentalist at infinity. Now my experimentalist uh, has all particles incoming. Uh, but uh, anyway, you imagine you're the simple-minded experimentalist at infinity. You get up in the morning, you collide the particles, you come back, you see what came out. Um, and um, that's it. You just have some cross sections. Maybe imagine my experimentalist actually has access to the amplitude directly. <laughs> okay, so let's say uh, you've measured these functions, which are just functions of the momenta and the helicities of the particles. How the hell do they know what happened inside? Right? It's the theorist who comes along and says, you know what's going on is that there are these things, and this went inside, and this hit that, and that hit that, and all this complicated stuff happened. 
and I have to sum over every way things can happen on the inside. So the entire inside of the space-time and the Hilbert space in which we think all this uh, wave function evolution is happening in are things that we integrate in in order to give a rational accounting for the patterns that the experimentalists have seen. So uh, both the in inside of the space-time and indeed the quantum mechanics itself in this case, because now we don't have the, at least the usual notions of time on the boundary, all those things are things that we integrate in in order to give a rational accounting for the patterns that this guy sees. And so the question that uh, many of us have been asking from many points of view is, given that we have lots of reasons to suspect that the inside of the space-time doesn't make uh, precise sense quantum mechanically, blah, 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 um, is there a different question? Is there something else that could be going on inside that can give us uh, uh, the answer? You know, is there some question we can ask in the space in which the amplitudes actually live, which is not the inside of the space-time, in the space that's, uh, that labels the boundary observables, is there a question we can ask in that space whose answer is all the richness and, complex and complexity of the scattering amplitudes? And the immediate difficulty that, uh, that, that, that uh, uh, Andy both beautifully explained and exemplified by all the, uh, I don't know what this weird theory is about uh, in his talk, <laughs> is that, um, uh, is that let, let's say we take the ob you know, one obvious place to go, the actual geometric boundary, the celestial sphere, spectacular, beautiful, right? You go there. What are you supposed to do there, right? That's what we kept asking Andy all day, right? You know, what are we supposed to do there? Well, it's this fucking unit sphere, right? You know, <laughs> what does locality mean? You can't get far from anything. It's a, it's a unit sphere. There's no obvious notion of time. What the hell are you supposed to do there, right? We don't know. We don't know what the answer is to what we're uh, supposed to do. Thinking about the symmetries and so on of the spectacular start, but it's a kinematical start, and we don't know what question breathes dynamics into this space. Okay? And my own attitude about the subject has been less to commit to specific thoughts about what the space should be and so on, but to sort of think more pragmatically. One way or another, whatever this boundary space is, it's just a space of, for example, if we have massless scattering, space of null momenta. Right? So that's our playground. Our playground is a space of n null momenta for scattering n particles. And now you have to ask, in that seemingly boring, dull space of just n null momenta. What the hell kind of question can you ask in that space whose answer has all the richness and complexity of local unitary scattering amplitude? So that's, the, that's been the big question. When you don't have a notion of locality, you don't have any kind of field theory to put there, anything normal that you can do there. So the, the spirit of this program is just adventure. You know, we just go out and look to see what's there and try to get clues from the answer and make guesses as to what these new principles might be. Um, but what we've been saying over the past 10 years or so is a kind of surprise, is that the kinds of ideas that are showing up, sort of rather mysterious, magical ideas that are showing up, have a distinctly combinatorial character to them. Okay? So you go to spaces that seem utterly dry and boring, and devoid of any interest, like n null momenta, and then you say a couple of words. Like, for example, the word ordering might make an appearance. Okay? So you might imagine there's some, some, some color ordering. So instead of just having a bunch of random labels, the labels, labels come in an ordering. And the word positivity makes an appearance. And somehow the combination of these words, ordering and positivity, puts just enough structure on these seemingly arid, boring spaces in order to allow them to breathe dynamical life into them and extract out of them uh, all the richness and, and complexity of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, physical amplitudes in interacting theories. OK, so um, uh, as I said, I'm not going to say anything about n equals 4 super Yang Mills uh, in this talk. In fact, what we're going to do is exemplify all these things in the simplest possible setting where what's going on inside, so let, let's say in conventional language, what would be going on inside is some planar phi cube theory. Okay, so, uh, so uh, planar, uh, that just means that uh, I'm just summing planar diagrams with cubic interactions. So there's some ordering for the external particles. Uh, um, just imagine that we're summing all these diagrams. Uh, these would be the Feynman diagrams or some color part, some, some piece of the color decomposition of Feynman diagrams for what's known as a biadjoint scalar theory, a phi cube theory where the phi has two color indices. Okay, but never mind. Uh, just large. just think of it at large n. So never mind. Uh, and the, the story is not restricted to planarity and so on and so forth. But let's just talk about this uh, simplest case to uh, get going. So what's going on inside this black box is that, from the conventional perspective, we're summing um, 
uh, these cubic Feynman diagrams. Let's just start off doing it at, at, uh, at uh, tree level. Okay, the story extends to higher loops, but we're just going to talk about uh, uh, tree level mostly for it today. All right, so let me just introduce a tiny bit of useful notation. Um, so let's just think about let's just think about writing down. Like, let's say I had this th this diagram one two three four five. Well, what are the propagators that occur here? It's like one over p one plus p two squared, and then you know one over p one plus p two plus p three squared. Let's say. And already you have the little annoyance that p1 plus p2 could instead be p3 plus p4 plus p5 and so on. But OK, so that's, uh, that's what I'd associate with this diagram. Now, it's actually uh, uh, very useful to, given that we have an ordering, to draw the sort of famous polygon that's been drawn many times. If you have n particles, you put the momenta end to end on a, uh, on a you know, uh, uh, on a, on a uh, d-dimensional piece of paper, and they form a closed close polygon. Um, so you see that <laughs> the only propagators that make an appearance involve a sum over a consecutive set of momenta, and these just correspond to a distance squared in this polygon. So if I have a point i and a point j here, I'm going to define xij to be just the sum of all the momenta from one place to another, pi dot 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 plus pj plus 1, all squared. OK? Now, these are very nice variables. First, all the propagators are just associated with the chords of this polygon. Um, and secondly, this is exactly the correct number of variables to be a basis for all the Mandelstam invariants. Because how many Mandelstam invariants are there? Well, at n points, there's all the pi dot pj. So there's n choose two of these guys. But there's minus n for momentum conservation, because the sum over pj is equal to 0. OK, so, the, uh, so the, the number of independent Mandelstam invariants is n choose 2 minus n. OK? And that's also the number of cores of a polygon. OK? So this is exactly equal to the number of xij's. Okay, just the, so we don't include these guys, but all the uh, other cores of the uh, polygon. All right? So these are some very nice variables. And furthermore, it's useful. Uh, it just makes it easier to draw pictures instead of drawing these cubic graphs all the time to actually draw a dual of these graphs. So what do I mean? So let's say at five points, instead of drawing a cubic graph, I draw my polygon and I triangulate it. Okay? So that diagram, the dual of that diagram, in the usual sense where you put a dot in the middle of all the points, okay, the dual of that diagram is a cubic graph. Okay? But uh, you see that the value of this cubic graph is just 1 over the product of the, of the x's that I see in the triangulation. Okay, so it would be like, in this case, it would be 1 over x13, x14. OK, and so with all this setup, we can now give a, a formula for what the conventional picture of what this experimentalist is seeing is. And the formula for the amplitude at endpoints would be formula for the amplitude at endpoints would be the sum uh, over all the triangulations of a polygon. This is all the Feynman diagrams. The product of 1 over all the xij's with ij inside the triangulation. Is that clear? So you just take every triangulation, 1 over the, the product of all the x's in the triangulation, and that's the Feynman diagram expansion for the amplitude. Okay, So that's just so we know concretely the object we're talking about. Yes. Sorry. No, no. Uh, I'm I'm working in. Uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm. This is a very important point. I'm working in principle in infinite number of spatial dimensions, space-time dimensions. So the only thing I care about is the Mandelstam invariance. I don't care about any of the gram determinant constraints that 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 tell you that you're living in a finite number of dimensions. Okay. But you know that's true of field theory amplitudes. They have a continuation to any number of dimensions, at least in these simple scalar cases. That's a very interesting question. I, well, we can come back to that question later. But this is, so the number of invariants is nn minus 3 over 2. Okay, just, just the number of these diagonals. Any questions about this so far? Sir? I'm a little bit So if I understand correctly, the number of dimensions is small. Yes. Then they have further That's right. And I'm ignoring all those relations. Yes. Also, yes. the number of momentum integrations will be different. Sorry? If you have a free graph, yeah. you're completely right. It doesn't matter. That's right. 
And when, when, uh, uh, so far in what I'm talking about here, when we talk about loops, we're going to talk about the integrand of the loops and talk about integration later. So it's just some rational functions, and those things don't depend on space-time dimension for these simple scalar theories. So later, when I actually want to do the loop integrations, that, that, then it will depend. But the actual, that's right. Well, I mean, I'm not even talking about loops in this talk, but if we're going to talk about loops, then we'd be talking about the integrand. And uh, so all this combinatorial geometry in the simple way associated with polytopes and positive geometries is at the level of integrand so far. There's some parallel story that people like Mark and Nastya and Goncharov and others have been seeing at the level of the final answers and special theories like n equals 4. They're clearly related to each other in some interesting ways. But I'm just talking about very basic things, emphasizing the word elementary in my uh, title. OK, so any more questions? So this is the concrete object we're talking about. I can tell you, for years and years, I've given talks about scattering amplitudes where I've said, all the magic in amplitudes is for gauge theories and gravity. There's nothing interesting going on for scalar theories. The only reason there's any magic is because of gauge redundancy and so on that hides uh, structure. And it turns out to be wrong. Okay, So this is not the, even the shortest expression for the amplitudes for these stupid theories. And it's because that even these phi cube theories have hidden symmetries. Just like the dual conformal symmetry of n equals 4 super Yang mills, there is an analog of that symmetry even for these dumb old theories, which had never been uh, noticed before, but is exposed and made obvious by this elementary geometry that I'm about to uh, 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 tell you about. Sorry, Nima, so yes. Really the, the planarity is the reason why you only had to sum like, over the guys in order? That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, so as I said, uh, there, there's a much larger set of objects we could be talking about, but, but for now, let's just focus about these, uh, on these planar things. All right. Now, now what I want to do for the next uh, 10 minutes or so is just, and if you take nothing away, else away from this talk, I just want you to get some very zeroth order idea for why it is there's something combinatorial going on. I mean, that's surprising, right? When, why, does, why should all of a sudden these weirdo combinatorial polytopes, all this weird stuff, why does it all of a sudden show up um, in this uh, very sort of basic part of physics? And I want to explain to you that there's a clue lying there in the structure of these answers sort of all along that it's only because we as theorists are too smart we didn't notice, and that a dumber experimentalist would have noticed. Okay? <laughs> so what I want, so, and I get in trouble all the time when I say this, please, video, I love experimentalists. When I say dumb, it's not pejorative, quite the opposite, okay? <laughs> Trust me. That, right? All right, so, um, okay, so let's, let's imagine, actually, I'm going to imagine two kinds of experimentalists. And anyone who knows experimentalists <laughs> knows that there are two kinds of experimentalists. There's experimentalists who are closet theorists. Those are people who kind of wish they wanted to be theorists. They couldn't sort of make it and so on. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and then there are real experimentalists, like real like awesome. They could give a rat's ass about theory. Okay? So I'm going to imagine I'm these two kind of experimentalists. So experimentalist number one is closet theorist experimentalist, so CTE. <laughs> right? And closet theorist experimentalists both these experimentalists have their fingers on the Mandelstam dial, right? So they're sitting at infinity. They're, they're twiddling these parameters. I'm imagining they can access all Mandelstam invariants. By the way, these experimentalists live in 2 comma 2 signature, because you can't actually access all Mandelstam invariants in 3, 1 signature. One of many clues that any very basic clues that a, a, a sort of picture like this has got to see causality and even the signature as an emergent property. Because if you stick in Lorentzian signature, you can't even access all these singularities and poles. But anyway, this imaginary closet theorist experimentalist has their finger on the Mandelstam dial. They're twiddling the dials. They don't know anything about Feynman. They don't know about any of this stuff. What do they notice? What do you think they notice? What's the first thing they notice about these amplitudes? What do you think they would notice? Poles. They would notice that they blow up somewhere, right? That's very exciting. So they, they, they blow up somewhere. And they would notice experimentally that they blow up when these xij's go to 0. So when the xij goes to 0, the amplitude blows up. Yeah, both of them, well, this, this, this first guy notices this. But because they're a closet theorist, they know that poles, when you see a pole, you should look at a residue. And they, they took complex analysis. And they're very proud that they should look at what happens near the pole, right? So what do they do? They say, aha, it's blowing up. So I'm going to study in great detail what the amplitude looks like around that pole. And what do they notice? They notice, of course, the famous factor of factorization, that as xij goes to 0, the amplitude factorizes into 1 over xij times some left amplitude times some right amplitude. right? So in the usual picture, we draw something like that for factorization. In the picture of the polygons, it's that if you have some chord, uh, 
when this chord goes to zero, you factorize into the product what you get for the smaller polygons. Okay, so that's what they would notice. They say, "Wow, this is super amazing." So they'd go to the, you know, their uh, Morion and two comma two signature, and they would say, "Guys, I've discovered this incredible thing that these things that I've measured, they have this property. They're poles, and they factorize on the poles. This must be some incredible clue for what's really going on. What's inside that question mark?" And indeed, there are two kinds of there are two theorists sitting in the audience uh, who jump at this to explain what's going on. Theorist number one is named Feynman. Okay, and Feynman says, ah, I know what's going on. What's going on is that you're summing over Feynman diagrams, <laughs> right? Okay? Uh, yes? So, um, if, if they're experimental, if even if they're small, just ones they probably live in the real world. Right? Yeah. So, so then the poles wouldn't be that sharp, right? Um, yeah, here I'm just talking about uh, this imaginary, I mean, everything is quite imaginary for these guys because they're not sharp. Uh, I'm, uh, and also, we can't even access these poles from massless particles in Lorentzian signature. So, so we, we really only see them in... Uh, so when I say that you imagine they can dial the Mandel stamps any how they want, they can't even do that in Lorentzian signature. They have to do that in 2-2 signature, if you're in four dimensions. Or in fact, DD signature for large D. Uh, split, split signature. But anyway, but it's true. I mean, uh, when I turn on at finite coupling, they're not exactly sharp. There are branch cuts and so on. But the, if the coupling is weak, they would still notice I mean, what, what the perturbative expansion means at, directly as a statement about the amplitudes is that the singularity structure is not arbitrarily complicated. That it's true, that sort of approximately poles, but then at next order it's not a pole but a cut, but the discontinuities across the cut sort of run out. You can't take too many discontinuities before you come back to something rational, and so on. Okay, so, so there is some grading by the degree of complexity of the analytic structure. Now, the fact that we don't understand the rules of the S matrix, even in perturbation theory, is a shocking fact in the year 2019 <laughs> that, uh, that we do not know. We know all the rules for Euclidean uh, conformal field theory and all these spectacular things, but we don't know if I hand you an S matrix to say, this is the answer. I don't know how to check if it's right or wrong. And it's precisely because of this deep thing of, of time. We don't know how to encode consistent causal evolution in somehow the analytic structure of the uh, S matrix. So we don't know the answer to that question. That's why we have to retreat to these situations. At tree level, we know the answer. At one loop, we know the answer. At two loops, we don't know the answer, still, you know, at the level of the final amplitude. But if you have this notion of the integrand, we know the answer. Because again, you have these rational functions and their pole structure has to satisfy the cutting rules and so on. So that's how the subject manages to make some progress, is that even though we don't know the ultimate answer, not even in perturbation theory, never mind not non-perturbatively, we know enough about it in corners to be able to get going. And we also have an opposite philosophy relative to the 60s now. Not that we're going to slavishly impose causality and unitarity to fix the analytic structure, which is hopeless and just wrong and doesn't work, but something more adventurous. We're going to guess something. We're going to guess some interesting new mathematical question in the relevant space and see those principles come out rather than put them in by hand. So it's the inversion of the philosophy, which is probably the most important thing, apart from the lots more data uh, and, uh, and some more practical attitude towards uh, making some uh, progress. But uh, anyway, here I'm talking about this very toy situation where it's just tree amplitude, there are these sharp poles, and that's, that's what they see. All right, now, so theorist number one says there's this inside of a space-time, the particles are moving around, they hit each other, I sum over all paths, and that manifestly has factorization in it. So in other words, this takes the clue of factorization and gives me pictures of particles in space-time. Person number two is called Deline. Okay? Deline has a very different picture. Deline and Mumford and friends have a very different picture. They say, you know, we're mathematicians. We have studied moduli spaces, and the dumbest, simplest moduli space in the world is of n particles on a line, n particles on P1. So since they're on a line, however you put them there, they're ordered somehow. You have 1, 2, 3, up to n, n points on, a, on P1 mod SL2. And now you say, well, what does this space look like? Well, as they move around, the points can bang into each other. But as we know, famously in string theory books, when some of these points uh, approach each other, that's a boundary of the space. But you can always do an SL2 transformation to undo it and make uh, the complementary set of points approach each other. So the boundary structure for the simplest moduli space in the world has this bubbling picture, right? So for example, at, at four points, you would say that this is one way 
that this moduli space uh, factorizes into these two worlds where this point is 3, 4 squashed together from the perspective of this world and 1, 2 squashed together from the perspective of that world. Okay? So, in other words, this fact that there's some factorization would strike Deleen as something totally different than it strikes Feynman. You say, aha, what must be going on is that whatever your amplitudes are, whatever they are, have something to do with this is bubbling picture. This is uh, the most basic thing in the world that I've seen that, uh, that factorizes in this way. And what, what does this correspond to? Of course, we just decorate this space with Coben Nielsen factors and integrate over it, and those are called string amplitudes. So this is the open string amplitude. This is the most primitive uh, uh, combinatorial underpinning of, of uh, uh, factorization. Um, and so this is associated with a picture of strings, the string world sheet. So I'm just uh, summarizing here this basic fact of factorization is encoded in the two pictures that we've had for 50 years about how to think about the most basic feature of, uh, of uh, scattering processes. And, and of course, we know how they're related to it. There's all sorts of wonderful things how they're related to each other and so on. Now, is there anything missing? What could possibly be left, right? What, what could possibly be left to be desired from this picture? Well, in order to see what's left to be desired, I'm now going to imagine that I'm the more cowboy experimentalist who doesn't know about poles or residues or anything like that. Okay, so this is the second experimentalist. The second experimentalist, the real experimentalist, okay? Real experimentalist doesn't know anything about poles, uh, doesn't know anything about residues, so what happens? They notice that, okay, so I have poles when some xij goes to zero, okay? And then they notice, for example, already at four points something interesting, that they can only make it sort of blow up once. They can send x13 to zero, or x24 to zero, or the s channel to zero, or the t channel to zero. If they send the S channel to zero, no matter what they do with T, they're not going to get another pole. Right? Everything is totally smooth in T. So you don't have these two uh, poles at the same time, S and T. Of course, Feynman knows why this is, because there was no propagator that has both S and T. That's locality. Right? But this experimentalist doesn't know anything about that. So that's one sort of cool thing. Sometimes uh, you know, at four points, you only get one, one pole appearing. So what are the poles that appear at n equals four? Well, just x14 and x, uh, sorry, x13 and x24. Okay, so this corresponds to that and that chord of the uh, that guy. Now, what about what if we go to n equals five? N equals five is a little more interesting, right? Now you can get two poles. So they they dial some things. So let's say x13 goes to zero, the amplitude blows up. Okay, so they notice when x13 goes to zero. So in other words, when you have and you have that chord, the amplitude blows up. But now, if they dial the other things, they find that they can make it blow up twice. They can get a second pole. So now they can sort of grade what they're seeing. What are the first poles? What are the sets of two poles that you can get? And then they can't get sets of three poles for n equals 5. But there's some interesting pattern. For example, if they have x13 to 0, they can see something where that guy also goes to 0, where that guy goes to 0, but they don't see something where that crossing one goes to 0. OK? Is that clear? So they just make a list. They don't know what's going on, so they just make a list. Here are the first poles I get. Here are the second poles that I get. What collections of, of x's show up in these poles? And they're a good experimentalist, so they want to like, present the data in a, in a, in a succinct way. Right? So they notice something cool, that the data for n equals 5 can actually be presented by the following picture. It's actually completely coincidentally a pentagon. It's not going to it's going to be more complicated in general, but it's completely coincidentally a pentagon, which is the following. So you want to think about the sort of inside of the pentagon as no poles at all. But you want to think about the edges as the single poles that you can have. So this edge would be, for example, that single pole. Right? But now what do these vertices mean? These vertices uh, these vertices are the further double poles that I can have compatible with having had that single pole. Okay, so for example, I can go here and I can have that double pole, or I can go here and I can have uh, the other double pole. Okay, and you don't have any more. Okay, so you draw this picture and you can easily convince yourself just by cycling it around that all the singularities that you have for this five-point answer, no poles, one pole, and two poles, 
are actually captured, interestingly, by this pentagon. Right? That's kind of cool that all this information about the combinatorics of which sets of poles occur together can actually be associated with a geometric shape. Right? Oh, that's a little trivial. Uh, by the way, what is it for four points? For four points, it's utterly trivial. It's just an interval. Right? So the inside would be a square. One end would be one triangulation. The other end would be the other triangulation. Okay, so that's the little pattern that we've seen so far. And now let's go up to n equals 6. n equals 6 is already more interesting because you have different kinds of diagram, right? You have the normal comb-like diagrams. You have the Mercedes-Benz diagram. If you draw it like, uh, like uh, uh, anyway, you have different kinds of triangulation even. Now can I have the, uh, can we switch to the, so, and you can stare at it, and it's not at all obvious. So you can get one set of poles, two set of poles, three set of poles for n equals 6. But so whatever it is, if you're going to try to make a shape, it would have to be a three-dimensional shape. right? Here we have two set of poles, so we can have a two-dimensional two shape. Whatever this is, if it could make sense, it would have to be a three-dimensional shape. It's kind of hard to visualize. This experimentalist doesn't care that much. Um, but I care about seeing the data. Unplug and replug. I can just turn the laptop around. No? That's connected. Okay. Well. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I have to bring the slide down for it to project. Yeah. Oh, Wendy. <laughs> That's kind of. Experimental. Yeah. But at the beginning of the talk, there was something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I'll leave. I'll. The first job talk I ever gave, the first job talk I ever gave, I had, a, I had the little pointer. It was a thing like this. I hit the board and I sliced right through it. My first act. <laughs> <laughs> so indeed. Uh, no comment. <laughs> All right. Look, I, I can just, uh, uh, this doesn't count for my time, right, Mark? <laughs> Counts double. All right. No? All right. It's not going to work. Uh. Is something coming up? No? Okay. All right. Look, I'll just, I'll just. Uh, I'll just turn the laptop around. You can you can you can see, but let me write let me let me, but for this one I'll just uh, write it down. Okay, so, so they they go to their uh, two comma two signature Morioned, and they say, look, this is the pattern that I saw. If I just look for n equals four, n equals five, n equals six, n equals seven, n equals eight, and I just see how many, and I'll just put zero poles. One pole, two poles, three poles, just how many did I find? So I'll just put, uh, never mind zero and n plus one, I'll just put ones there. But for n equals four, you get these numbers. Those are the, the s and the t channel. Uh, for n equals five, we just saw this pentagon, five edges, five vertices. Anyway, so they just count. For n equals six, they get these numbers. For n equals seven, And you know, of course, uh, if you know that what, what you're doing is triangulating a polygon, this is, of course, counting all the partial triangulations of the polygon, from none to the finest. Okay? But what I want to stress is that there are these interesting numbers that come out. So I'm just counting how many, how many distinct poles are there, how many distinct pairs of poles, how many tri triples of poles that show up, and so on. Okay? Well, how are you yeah. 
one. I'm putting the one, so I'm doing this because I'm going to do an Euler sum in a second. Okay, so the experimentalist would not, would, would stop here and there and there and there. Okay? Okay, so that's, that's the data they would present. And uh, some theorists in the audience might look at this and notice that the alternating sums of the numbers in all these columns is zero. Okay? So that's very interesting. That's completely unobvious. Even, for, even when you count the triangulations of a polygon, there's a formula for it, there's some, some hypergeometric function formula for it. It's not obvious that the sum of these things adds up to zero. Okay? But the theorist now says, look, there must be some kind of shape, right? I, sh I should be able to find some shape that has some three-dimensional shape that has this many faces, that many vertices, uh, sorry, this many faces, that many vertices, that many edges, okay? And so on. Okay, so I, I, I actually, I, I reversed it. I did it backwards. So this would be, uh, yeah, anyway. So it, this is single poles, double poles, triple poles, and so on. I'm, I'm, going, I'm going backwards. All right. Sorry? It's the only characteristics. I do the, so they would just notice that these numbers add up to something. And so then the theorist might do some work and see that for six points you get the following remarkable shape. Okay? So this is a shape. It's known as the isosahedron. Uh, and all of the, what, what's drawn here are 14 vertices. Each vertex is a triangulation of a hexagon. Okay? And two vertices are connected if those triangulations are connected by a coarser triangulation where you remove one of the, where you remove one of the cords. And so that those haven't been filled in, but you could fill in the whole rest of, you could fill in the whole rest of the picture. This is a quite non-trivial fact that the, that the, that the, uh, that the collections of poles that show up can actually be captured by a shape. And in fact, this was discovered by Jim Stashev when he was a Princeton grad student in the 1960s. In the 60s, he realized that the combinatorics of triangulations of a polygon could be captured by a surface, but he didn't even realize that it could be flat like this, that it would look polytopal. Okay, so what's interesting about the shape is that it's actually flat, right? It's, it's really, it's like a, a, a polytope. His uh, thesis advisor came to his defense with a cardboard cutout of this shape to show that it's possible. But it wasn't for another 20 years till mathematicians realized how to do this in general. Okay, so it's not at all obvious that the triangulations of a polygon can be associated with a polytopal shape uh, in this form. Yes, sir. Oh well, and it's and it's connection to physics, and it's connection to physics via the fact that the triangulations of the polygon are encoding locality. Right, so that, that's, that's right. That, that, True. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes, yes, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yes. Well, it has to do with the locality. It most certainly does have to do with the physics. Yes. 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 Well, this is why the, this is why the, the, the surprise was surprising to Jim Stashev in 1960 when he didn't know anything about physics. Indeed. Okay. All right. That's what I'm about to tell you in the rest of the talk. Okay. All right. So now, since since we're here and I'm not going to be able to show you uh, other things, let me just show you all these things now. Here's another version of the isosahedron. Okay. Um, you see, uh, you won't be able to quite tell from so far away, but it's exactly the same shape combinatorially, but it's a very specific shape. You see it has some very specific sides that are parallel to each other and so on. Okay? This is a definition of the isosahedron that, uh, that uh, some of us ran into about a year and a half ago, um, and motivated by, by the physics of scattering amplitude. Not, one of the, not even one of the standard uh, realizations that, uh, uh, that the mathematicians had seen. Um, uh, and anyway, it's, it's a bit of an interesting story. This, I mean, the, the whole fact that these objects were polytopal was a curiosity for a long time. People got more interested uh, in it in the last 15 years or so in the context of this sort of exciting and mysterious subject in mathematics having to do with cluster algebras, something that Mark and Nassia and friends are world experts in around here. Um, but uh, uh, these are larger collections of combinatorial objects, not just triangulations of a polygon, but larger collections of combinatorial objects that have uh, that show up uh, all over the place, which are also polytopal. Okay? And also, eventually, people found a way to cut them out with inequalities, but it was not obvious, again, still conceptually, why that was possible. Um, but this picture that we found from, from physics uh, inspired our mathematician friends to immediately find the conceptual explanation for why these polytopes exist for all the cluster algebras, and not just, uh, not just, uh, uh, not just the ones that we ran into. But what I want to say, um, is that uh, 
This is what the second experimentalist is, is excited about. They say, look, it's kind of mind-blowing that this pattern of uh, poles that you see are associated with a shape. Okay? They don't notice this thing about factorization. In fact, later, you notice that this fact about the shape also implies factorization. Implies factorization because you notice that when you go to the boundaries of the shape, on the boundary, geometrically, what the boundary looks like is a direct product of lower isosahedra of the same type. So the second fact actually has all the information in it, um, but, um, uh, uh, but, is, uh, but is, goes beyond what is visible either in Feynman diagrams or in the world sheet. Okay. So what I want to do in my remaining 15 minutes, Mark, <laughs> Uh, is, um, is give you a picture for where this is coming from. And the, the uh, picture, uh, I'll just give the picture in, the, in this story of triangulations of the polygon. This picture actually extends to all the so-called finite type cluster algebra polytopes in more or less exactly the way that I'm, uh, in a generalization of what I'm uh, describing, but I'll just uh, restrict to this, to this case. And uh, but the way I'm going to tell the story is to exemplify this uh, idea that you go to a seemingly boring, dry space, and you say the word positivity, and something interesting begins to happen. So forget about everything, but let me tell you what the goal is. The goal is that if we take Feynman diagrams, factorization is obvious. If we take the world sheet, the lean Mumford, factorization is obvious. The polytopal nature is not obvious. What I now want to do is come up with some picture, some model, for which everything is obvious. The polytopal feature is obvious. The factorization is obvious. All of it is obvious. And this is not just going to be some nice thing to feel good. Uh, the association with these polytopes uh, is, going to be, is going to reveal these hidden symmetries of these dumb old phi cubed amplitudes that I alluded to earlier. Okay? Um, and I probably won't have any time to, uh, to actually explain how that works, but I'll try to at least explain where these shapes uh, uh, come from. But for now, relax. Let's forget about everything um, that I was talking about, and let's talk about the wave equation. So we're going to solve the wave equation in 1 plus 1 dimensions. Okay, so, so here's time, here's space. So I'm solving the equation dt squared minus dx squared. Capital X is my variable, and I have a source, little j. OK, so I can switch the light cone variables, u and v. And so then it's du dv capital X equals j. And let's uh, remember that uh, if I give the values of x on the boundaries of a causal diamond, uh, let's say on the past boundaries of a causal diamond, I, I predict what x is everywhere inside the uh, causal diamond. Okay? So if I give the value here, some a at u and b at v, let me call the common value here a c, then I can predict what x is anywhere inside. Right? So if I have a point u at v, then x at u at v is a at u plus b at v minus c plus the integral of this current inside the diamond. Okay? So that's just the solution of the wave equation. You trivially take du dv, it's equal to j, and these other pieces guarantee that the boundary conditions work on the edges of the diamond. Now, in fact, there's a more there's a slightly nicer way of saying this in terms of the integral form of the wave equation, the Gauss's law form of the wave equation in 1 plus 1 dimensions. So what is Gauss's law for the wave equation in the Lorentzian signature? Gauss's law is simply the following statement, that if you give me any causal diamond and the values at, at the corners are a, b, c, d, Gauss's law just tells you that a plus b minus c minus d is equal to the total charge inside that diamond. Okay? And so this is the integral form, and if you shrink the diamond to zero size, you recover the wave equation, right? du dv equals the local current density. Okay? Any questions about this? It's just ba basic wave equation stuff. Let me mention one last simple fact about the wave equation. All of you who've played with shock wave solutions and so on, these totally trivial things are familiar with. Uh, let's say you have a solution of the wave equation. And out here, it's x right. And out here, it's x left. And you have two 45 parallel 45 degree lines. Then I can make a new solution of the wave equation where I just scrunch these regions together. Okay? So I just remove the whole region inside. I have x right and x left. And here, I add a delta function source that just accounts for all the charge that I had in there. Okay? And why is that correct? Simply because 
Well, we know it's just Gauss's law. A plus B minus C minus D is going to equal J. That's all we need, and that's guaranteed if I add this delta function source to the scrunched region. OK, so that's all we're going to know, need to know about the wave equation. So, so far, so boring. But now we're going to add the word positivity. OK. So what I, I'm now going to add, I'm now going to ask the following question. Let's say that the source is positive. So imagine that I want to know what's going on inside this, uh, that sort of half of a causal diamond. So let's say that the source is positive. Uh, let's define what I mean by x equals 0. So x is 0 at the tip there. And I now want to ask the question, what does it take for x to be positive everywhere inside? So that's what I want to impose. Okay? The source is positive, and I also want x to be positive everywhere inside this uh, wedge. Okay? A moment's thought uh, shows, I won't justify it now, that it suffices to solve the problem where x is also equal to 0 on this future boundary. Okay? So now I'm just solving the wave equation where x is 0 on the future boundary. I, the source is positive. I want the x to be positive everywhere. And so I'm trying to find what constraints do I put on a at u and b at v. What constraints on these boundary values do I have in order to ensure that the solution is positive everywhere inside? OK, simple question. OK, now, this question is still a little hard. I'm, I'm looking for a, you know, a constraint on a continuum of values of a of, a of u. Let me just do one basic thing very quickly, that uh, if I just draw that the obvious like cones in this picture, then you see I have this a, this a plus that b minus 0 minus 0 is equal to the j in there. So I learn that if I know a, I know b. And so it suffices to just give the information about what a is here. So now what I'm really trying to do is figure out in the space of all a's on this side, what set of functions there uh, are compatible with x being positive everywhere inside. Okay? Is that clear? And this problem is still too hard, but let's now s sneak up on it. So let us look at, instead of what happens, looking at what happens at A everywhere, let's imagine that I just try to figure out what is A at this one point. Let me call this point A1. What can I say about the value of A at the point 1? Well, we just drew this picture. There's the natural light cones that uh, are associated with the picture. So I know that a1 plus b1 is equal to some j. And so since I need all the a and b to be positive, if I sort of plot what I can have in a1 space, a1 itself has got to be positive. So here's a1 equals 0. But here's a1 equals j. Remember, j is positive. And so at a1 equals j is where b1 equals 0. So you see that a1 has got to lie inside this little interval. OK, that's kind of interesting. Let's now try to get more information in here. So let's say I want to know about the value of a at two points. Here's a second point, a2. There's a cousin b2 here. And now there's an interesting point c in the middle of the space. All right. Now let's just look at these five points. And let's write down all the Gauss law conditions. So we, we can call them these mesh relations, or the Gauss law conditions. So the Gauss law conditions tell us that, for example, from this mesh, that a1 plus c minus a2 is equal to some j. From this mesh, that c plus b2 minus b1 equals some j prime, again positive. And from this mesh, I, I get that a2 plus b1 minus c is some j double prime. OK? That's it. So you notice these are three equations that I can solve for, let's say, b1, b2, and c in terms of a1 and a2. Right? And remember, I need b1 and b2 and c to be positive. So if I plot the region that I can have in a1 and a2 space, well, a1 is positive, a2 is positive, but each one of b1, b2, and c are going to define a line in this space. Okay? And if you plot what it looks like, you get a pentagon. All right, now, uh, let's keep going. Say I add a third point, a3, there's some c prime, some c double prime, and some b3. Now, I won't write all of them down, but let's just count. We have nine points in here. 
We have six of these relations, six of these meshes. So I have six equations for the nine unknowns. And therefore, in A1, A2, A3 space, I'm going to get some polytopal shape. Okay? That polytopal shape is exactly the isosahedron that we discovered in the form that we discovered a year and a half ago. Okay? And so that's the answer to this question. The answer to the question, uh, what space of positive things on the outside is compatible with positivity everywhere inside, is that the things on the outside have to live inside the isosahedron. But not any old isosahedron, the isosahedron that we found a year and a half ago from, uh, from other points of view motivated by physics. Now, I'm just telling you that, but why is it the isosahedron? This is the last thing I'll do, and then I'll stop. Um, you see, what I now want to show you is that this wave equation picture, the way I've described it is manifestly polytopal, just by construction, right? I'm forcing all these things to be positive, so it's cutting out some region. Manifestly polytopal. So now in order to show you that it's the isosahedron, I have to show you that it factorizes. Why does it factorize? Right? That's the thing that Feynman and Deline were telling us, but they're blind to the polytopal structure. Now we have the polytopal structure. Now we're going to see why it factorizes. And it's clear as day. Let's go to this picture and just say it in the continuum. Okay? So here you are. What does it mean to go to a boundary of the space? It means that while all the x's are positive, uh, in general, you might go to a boundary where x vanishes at one point inside. Okay. All right, if x vanishes at one point inside, there is then a natural question. Let's look at all the light cones coming out of the point. Okay, and now there's a natural question. Where else can x vanish? What's another place that I could put x to 0? Okay. And it's very easy to see that I cannot put it to 0 in any of the red region. The red region are the points that are space-like separated from x but are causally connected to it. Why is that? Because if any such thing existed, I would go back to my diamond picture. Remember, the Gauss law condition says a plus b minus c minus d is j. j is positive. So if I put a and b to 0, this is inconsistent. Two negative things equal something positive. So I can't do that. So if there's any causal diamond in my spacetime, I can't put the two things on the space-like ends to 0 at the same time. Okay, that's inconsistent with positivity. And so nothing, so in the past and the future I can, that's fine. And things that are far enough away so that the signals for them don't reach before death at the top is fine. But everything inside here I can't set to zero. Now furthermore, it's more than that. Everything inside here is also totally irrelevant to the, uh, to, uh, if I give you the data of what's outside, I fully determine what's inside these little regions, right? For example, just by knowledge of what's going on in these boundaries, I know everything in here. Just by knowledge of what's going on in these boundaries, I know everything in there. The stuff inside there is completely irrelevant. I can completely uh, reconstruct it from the knowledge of things on the boundaries. So I'm trying to figure out what this boundary looks like, and now I know what it looks like. Let me just make a new solution by scrunching these guys away and by scrunching those guys away. What do I get if I scrunch those guys away? See, I get this top little triangle. And then I have to add the delta function source here. I have to add the delta function source there. Those are just positive. So what I discover is on this boundary, what does it look like? It looks like the direct product of exactly the same kind of object with two smaller shapes. Okay. So this very simple system and the, the uh, the, the way the causal diamonds break up this, uh, this wedge into, into naturally causally connected and disconnected regions in this way is exactly capturing the combinatorics of factorization in spacetime. Okay? And this is a picture for what's going on that makes the polytopal nature manifest and it makes the factorization manifest. Unlike both Feynman diagrams and the world sheet that only make factorization manifest but for which the polytopal picture is mysterious. Now, I'm out of time, uh, so um, uh, let, me just, let me just declare, and I'll, uh, I won't say much more, that, uh, as I said, this is not just some like, empty moving around equations and so on. I mean, it has content. Um, uh, this picture, this picture uh, uh, in order to connect these pictures to the amplitudes, um, 
associated with these shapes, something we've been seeing for the past many years, is that there are differential forms that have singularities on the boundaries of this shape. So given any old polytope, there's a canonical differential form associated with it uh, that has singularities on the boundaries of the shape and only on the boundaries of the shape. So given a shape, you get a form okay, that, that is a slave to the shape. And that form is what we associate with the amplitudes. Now, since the polytopes are complicated, in order to compute the form, one very natural thing to do is to tr tr triangulate it somehow. And so if you're given these interesting shapes, uh, there are various natural triangulations. And I'll just declare one of the triangulations of the isosahedron has a name that's known as Feynman diagrams. Okay? One of many triangulations of the isosahedron is known as Feynman diagrams. And it's kind of a weird one. Just to give you a sort of picture for it, it's sort of as if you want to triangulate this uh, quadrilateral. And instead of doing the sort of most obvious thing, which is doing something like that, you actually pick some plane in, line at infinity, and you draw lines like that. So you make that big triangle, and you subtract this triangle, and you subtract that other triangle, and you add that, that, that triangle. Okay? So Feynman diagrams correspond to a kind of peculiar factorization. It's sort of much more natural from the perspective of the dual of this polytope. But anyway, this is a, uh, uh, it's a particular triangulation. And it's a weird triangulation because term by term, it forces the answer to have a singularity that is absent in the full thing. Term by term, it has a singularity at infinity, which is absent um, in the full sum and is only seen to be absent when you sum every term together. No subset of the Feynman diagrams reveals this fact. Okay? That is the hidden symmetry that I was telling you about. That hidden symmetry is the literal analog of dual conformal symmetry in n equals 4 super Yang Mills. Now there's no supersymmetry, there's no integrability. You can't blame it on any of those things. This is just the fact about dumb old phi cube theory. And that fact, and the fact that we know what the shapes are, actually give rise to totally different triangulations and totally different recursion relations for computing them. Not BCFW, not any of these things. Different ones where, you know, if you want an endpoint amplitude, whereas there's order 4 to the n Feynman diagrams, there are order n terms in the recursion relation. So incredibly tiny, compact expressions for what might, uh, of course, there are, there are n terms which are products of lots and lots of things, uh, which are sums of lots of things, but which are built recursively. So it's, it's just a fact of life that uh, you can sort of press return on your computer and have the answer in, in a few seconds rather than uh, much, much longer. Okay? So but anyway, that's that, that, the, the real point is that there's a hidden symmetry of the answer, which is made manifest by this polytopal business and is not obvious in either Feynman diagrams or the path integral. And the final thing I'll say is something that we discovered with Thomas Lamb in the past uh, month or so, is that there have been a number of standard ways by now of associating canonical forms with polytopes. The whole story of the amplitahedron is a much fancier thing where we don't know uh, so many ways of associating canonical forms with the polytopes. Amplitahedra are much sort of deeper and richer objects than uh, polytopes. But already for polytopes, we had a variety of sort of canonical ways of associating uh, canonical forms with them. But we found a, a, a natural new one, which was an outgrowth of some work we'd done uh, a couple years ago. And this natural new one actually naturally gives you a stringy generalization of the canonical form. Now, not just a canonical form, but a canonical form with some alpha prime attached to it. And you don't just get functions with poles, but you get meromorphic functions with infinitely many poles. So this is true for any polytope. It has nothing to do with physics, nothing. You just want to build these canonical forms. You associate them with certain integrals, and they naturally come along with an alpha prime. You know, Euler could have done this. In fact, in a sense, Euler did do this in his uh, thinking about the beta function. When you apply literally that construction for the canonical form to this picture of the isosahedron, you get the world sheet integral, the Coben Nielsen integral. Okay? There's no correlation functions of vertex operators in a world sheet conformal field theory. You don't even see the world sheet. Okay? But from this more combinatorial point of view, you land on the nose on the Coben Nielsen amplitude. So the part of my talk that I really didn't get to say much about of where this elementary positive geometry gives you particles and strings, at least uh, you get a flavor of it that the particle picture corresponds to a particular triangulation of isosahedra that lands you on Feynman diagrams. And the string picture is associated with a, uh, is a the specialization that's valid for any old polytope of a stringy version of canonical form uh, for these things that, are, that come from the causal diamonds and uh, and uh, sosahedra that uh, land you on, uh, on Coben Nielsen integrals. And as with the case for the amplitudes, it's not just sort of empty exercises and moving formulas around. This way of thinking about the string amplitudes suggests new formulas for them, new ways of evaluating them, computing them, and seeing some interesting uh, uh, new properties of them.
All right, thank you very much. Oh, sorry, not to. Yes. 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 Sure. Yes. 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 That's right. That's because in that case, what what uh, string field theory is the close analog of Feynman diagrams in this picture. So you don't actually see it. So in fact, string. Yeah. Because you don't see it there. I mean, what, what, so uh, I, don't know whether, I don't know whether the string amplitudes have a new symmetry, but I'm telling you that the field theory limit has a symmetry in a specific sense. I mean, that there's a, there's a very precise sense when you talk about not functions, but certain differential forms that are canonically associated with amplitudes. That, that these differential forms have a local GL1 invariance that is invisible term by term. In every Feynman diagram, it is only there in the sum. The analog of string field theory, string field theory is like, I mean, loosely, is like cutting the world sheet up by putting a point in the middle and just chopping it up in, into pieces. That's like adding this thing at infinity, this sort of artificial singularity infinity. It actually makes it worse, right? You add something and it cancels out in, 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 in the whole sum. When you see that what you're doing is cutting something up, then you can do it in a way that doesn't introduce any spurious thing at all. You just cut it up purely internally. <laughs> that doesn't correspond to anything I'm familiar with in, in, in string, string field theory. And it gives you formulas where you know, the, the building blocks don't look like Feynman diagrams. And that's very similar to what we see in, in, in n equals 4. Just in n equals 4, it's fancier. So in n equals 4, there are these Yangian invariants and Grassmannians and blah, 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 BCFW, all that stuff, where term by term, again, they're not local. They're not in interpreted with Feynman diagrams or the sort of fancier things. Um, well, here we're seeing exactly the same things, but in a, in a more elementary setting. Andy also has a very quizzical look. Yeah, so, so is it in the, the Gauge redundancy. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I said for many years. Yes. And now, yeah. That reason led one to believe that, that the simplifications would continue to all these orders and to not. Yes, yes. But here you're looking at some specific <coughs> parameterization of the diagrams and say that the way that we construct them is the symmetry of the sum of the diagrams. Which cancels, I, so. I, what, what I can tell you is the following, is that at first, I, I didn't have any chance to explain it, but, but exactly these sort of pictures of, of, uh, of this kind of wave equation picture with very small decorations um, uh, uh, continues to a broader set of, uh, of amplitudes. In fact, up to, up to sort of one loop without sort of falling off a log, you, uh, you, you get it from these pictures. There's, uh, there's an interesting generalization. We're, we're still trying to understand property to all loop order. What we have already to all loop order, though, is a representation of this form that makes it manifest that it has this hidden symmetry. It's all loop order. It has nothing to do with uh, tree level or, or anything like that. So uh, um, somehow, uh, uh, somehow it seems that what's really going on is not so much. So the distinction between Yang-Mills and this phi cube theory is, uh, is or Yang-Mills and gravity on one hand and these phi cube theories on the other is simply the following. And in fact, it's also related to the, what the world sheet is making manifest. What this theory has is every singularity that's completely generic to any theory you could imagine. Because any theory you could imagine, whatever it is, quartic, quintic, whatever vertices it has, the most general singularity you could imagine are these ones where you factorize everything to a cubic vertices. And if you don't say anything else, that's it. That's factorization, collinear limits, and so on. That's true for scalar theories and for anything. Feynman diagrams, anything you draw, the pole structure you see has these singularities in it. Yang Mills and gravity have something more. They have soft singularities, right? uh, which you know and love. Those soft singularities are not so obvious in just the poles. They have to do with the polarization vectors and in other ways of doing things. They have to do with the actual spin or helicity variables, not just the dumb pole structure. But so you're saying yeah. this is true for just for That's right. So what I'm saying is the following. So there's one, so, so there's one you know, somewhat magical fact that the, that the singularity structure of even the most primitive thing that, that's there universally for any theory is geometric. That's, that's interesting. Furthermore, when you have Yang Mills and gravity, you also have the soft singularities. Now, if you chase those soft singularities down, you ask, is there a geometry that also controls the soft singularities? The answer is the amplitohedron. That's the difference between these things, is that there are things that have factorization only, but also have the extra things that you have in, 
Yang Mills. And gravity is still mis mysterious, but it's somehow connected to Yang Mills through double copy or other things. We don't, we don't know. But certainly, the extra singularities that you have make the geometry much richer. It's no longer polytopal, but it's still, it's still combinatorial. And it's still captured by some geometry. That's the surprise. Why is this the case? I don't know. But, um, but that's part of the overarching philosophy, that we're going to kinematic space and in kinematic space. Now, all this stuff is in, you know, you know, morally, this is all in the boundary of Minkowski space, right? Uh, not Minkowski <laughs> in the appropriate signature, but just in the space of kinematic invariance. We're finding these regions that are cut out by positivity conditions in the way I've described. And the, once you say those words, ordering and positivity, then there are some shapes that, uh, that come alive in these spaces. And when you ask these natural questions of these shapes, you get answers that are local and unitary. Um, uh, if you chase that philosophy down for Yang Mills, you shouldn't stop at the factor of D. You should go all whole hog for all the singularities there are. If you go whole hog for all the singularities there are, you will discover the amplitude That's what the amplitude is, at least for, for, uh, for planar theories. Nothing to do with n equals 4, given. Any planar theory, the singularity structure is universal and is captured by the, by the amplitude OK, so I think we should wrap up the questions here because we have urgent business to address one of the most important fine-tuning problems in physics, which is why should the amount of time between the lecture today and Nima's birth be an integer number <laughs> of Earth years? And moreover, the ancient Mesopotamians noticed that, in fact, it's also an integer number of Martian uh, uh, sidereal, uh, synodic periods. That makes more sense, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so Earth, Earth, Mars, and the Sun are back in the same position they, w they were some integer number of periods ago. And uh, as we thank Nima, we will then walk outside to celebrate this occasion with cake and champagne. Oh. <laughs> oh.